This is your world So let's vow to make it a better place Let every heart that needs to know Your love is here to stay Ooh, It's time we live a new life Ooh, Let us love shine bright in you We're saved by His grace So we embrace your love today We are changed The Lord will work out His plan for my life. He'll work out His plan for my life. When I was going through that cancer, I had a dependence on God issue. I had become so dependent on my intellect concerning health and wellness and supplements. And I was taking almost, woo, close to 60-something uh, different pills a day because I'm, I'm preparing to never have to go through anything. I'm, I'm dependent on these things to get me there. And God said, all right. And then I started noticing. I mean, I should have the strongest immunity system of everybody in the world, all them pills. <laughs> all them pills and then working out and all that stuff we did. What, what, what's going on? And then COVID hit. Who, me? Where'd that come from? My immunity system is supposed to be Superman immunity. What the world? <laughs> and then after that, I'm like, you know, shingles? How that? That's an immune. My, is my immunity weak? It's supposed to be strong. I'm taking 75, 80 pills a day. What's up? <laughs> I'm getting IVs. I got a schedule for my health and wellness. And then after shingles, another immunity thing, cancer? And then tumors? I'm thinking, something wrong. And the Lord said, you have, to, you have valued and added value to an idol other than me that you depend on more than me. But I'm working it. I'm working it. I got you. I'm working it. I'm going to take you through these things the next three years. And you're going to get this out of the way, and you're going to know that you can depend on me. <laughs> you got it? See, I can boldly stand up here and tell you this stuff without any shame because I'm better as he continues working in me. Amen. Some people never, never get it, and then they end up dying because they don't see it's, it's more than what you're going through. It's where God's trying to get you. He's working out a plan for you. And the plan he worked out for me is totally delivered from people, totally depend on God for everything, ain't got time for no stress. I ain't stressing over nothing. I am not spending my peace over nothing. Somebody said, well, what if somebody died? Jesus said that the dead bury the dead. <laughs> I get there when I get there. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not letting nobody's drama, nobody's emergency to become an emergency of my life. I mean, that's your emergency. It'll be fine. Well, why is it taking so long? They did it with Jesus. He's he been dead for four days. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, it's all right. I'm the resurrection and the life. <laughs> and we let, too much, we let too much bother you. Stress. Comes, starts off invisible, but it ends up manifesting in your life physically. And you don't think that's an issue? It is an issue. You've got to recognize toxicity in relationships, and you can't continue in toxic relationships or toxicity will kill you. But even in the middle of toxicity, God wants to teach you how to be at peace in the midst of a storm. He's training you. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. So this is an act of love. And here's what the guy says who's going through things. Here's what I said. Don't abandon me. You made me, Lord. I'm yours. Don't abandon me. 
I don't think I missed one preaching assignment for any of that stuff. Because God said, you got to know that grace is sufficient. You got to know that when you're weak, I am strong. And the only way you could tell something was going on with me is because my pants were falling off. <laughs> and I'm not too sure I want all that stuff back on. <laughs> I'm wearing stuff now I could never wear with all that. <laughs> but how to continue on without complaining? That was a time I was praying, Lord, don't let me get into self-pity. How many times do we get into self-pity? Because, you know, we start getting on folks, you know. When I was sick, ain't nobody here from you. When I was that, you didn't do. You know how we do to try to feed that ego and feed that self? And God begins to teach you. Te taught me about complaining. And complaining is expressing your dissatisfaction or displeasure for anything. So you come in and see Cheerios. I don't want no Cheerios. I don't like them. That you complain about the Cheerios. Shut your mouth up. Eat them or look at them and say, praise God. <laughs> Amen? How many of y'all ready for God to continue his work in you? All right, you got to know he's taking you to a higher place. I'm expecting to be— I, I feel like I'm at a higher place in a, in a lot of things in my life now as a result of stuff, especially hearing from the Holy Spirit on assignments and seeing and understanding things and just a lot of, a lot of things I couldn't even listen to about right now as a result of these past three years. Praise God. But then part of my mind thought, well, this is just natural. This is just regular. I'm like, no, there's a higher plane that God's trying to put me on, and I can't reduce my thinking to that human plane. Oh, God, you're supposed to die now. I'm not doing that. Oh, I look forward to heaven, but not now. I got to finish my series. <laughs> if I started the thing, I want to finish it with God. All right, now watch this. So we got, all, we got into all of that with this statement that God never saves a person and leaves that person to himself to finish the good works. God himself perfects that which he has begun. To me, that was a revelation. God's the one that's working in me. He perfects what he started. Say it out loud. God perfects what he starts. God is perfecting me right now. All right, so he is responsible for performing the change. He's responsible for performing the work. So the same grace, the same loving kindness of God, which sent his son to the cross and brought salvation, also disciplines and perfects that life which is born of God. Wow. He disciplines and perfects our life. I need to hear that. You need to hear that. He disciplines and perfects our life. What happens when you start understanding this? You start looking at your life and say, oh, God, I depend on you. Help me. Show me how to do this. I'm desiring to want to do the things that you want me to do because he's given you the desire to do that. But then sometimes even desiring to want to live a certain way and, and, and to do these things right, you, you, don't, you, you don't get it all away. And you're like, all right, God, I'm, I'm trusting you. You're doing the work in me. And that keeps you away from condemnation and beating yourself up because you know that God's doing the work in you. Now, it's not to be used as an excuse. Well, I cussed her out, but God, you working on me, so I might cuss out again. See, that's just stupid. It don't even sound right, do it? You, you, you don't know the Lord. You ain't spending no time with him. You just want to cuss people out. You're going to mess around and get cussed out for somebody who just started their own course one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> All right. Now, let's look at Philippians 2, verse 13 in NLT one more time. Oh, I think I see clearly what, what God is saying here. It's, imagine if you would have understood this the first week you were saved. Wow. 
what God could have done. Philippians 2, 13, you're familiar with this. For God is working in you. There it is again. God's working in you. Doing what? Giving you the desire. So he's working on your desire, and he's giving you the power or the ability to do what pleases him. So you're going you're gonna to want to do what pleases him, and you're going to be able to do what pleases him. So the continuous work of the Holy Spirit is to get you to where you want to please him and to get you to where you are able and well suited to please him. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at John 16 and 13. John 16 and 13, and you, you know I have to share the Scriptures because if I don't, you think I'm making this up. But what's happening as I teach this, and then you go look at the Scripture and say, oh my God, there it is. Verse 13 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into what? Into all truth. And I'm, you know, grace and truth. Grace is the truth that makes men free. He will guide you. The Spirit of grace is going to guide you into all grace. He's going to guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. That's how intimate this relationship is going to be. You will not be surprised. Now, this, this thing here, this is unknown to the law. Under the law, nobody had access to this kind of guidance and this type of work by the Holy Spirit. Nobody. They had the law, but no Holy Ghost to guide them through it. I, that's why I don't understand people still, still trying to teach people about living under the law. We are, the Bible says we're not under the law, but we're under grace. And being under grace means we have a God. We have the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? Under this covenant of grace, you have the Holy Spirit. Under the law, you have no access to the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide and to do the work in you. We are pri privileged today to have the very tutor living in us. So morality is going to be achieved by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, whereas morality was, they, they tried to achieve morality in the Old Testament through rules and regulations. Now, that's what happens in the world today with unsaved people who are trying to live morally right without God. They're trying to live morally right without God. And so they have to take a hold of, uh, you know, human efforts of uh, determination and discipline and, and rehearsing a thing and trying to drive it in. And they achieve some source of morality that sticks, but it doesn't have the right attitude attached to it, nor does it depend on God. And so what happens is in this time of the covenant of grace, you have the Holy Ghost who is the Spirit of grace. You cannot separate the life of grace from the Holy Spirit of grace. It is the Spirit of grace that will supply the grace for all of your needs while he's taking you through this process. Every born-again life has access to gifts after gifts after gifts after grace. The Bible says it'll be grace upon grace and more grace. It's not grace just to get saved, but honey, it'll be grace to pay your bills one day. It'll be grace to heal your body one day. I am a recipient of the grace of God to heal my body, praise God. Not just a recipient of an operation, but a recipient of the grace of God of a particular type of protocol that, that only 300 people knew in this country. I was a recipient of that by grace. And so he says, whatever this life has to offer, there's a new deal of how God now deals with man under this new covenant. And he deals with us through grace. Grace is provision for everything.
everything in your life. Grace is provision for your spirit, your soul, your body, your finances, your relationship, your bad attitude. Grace is provision for it all. You can't take credit for nothing. That's why when you get to heaven, you don't roll out that long toilet paper roll of all the good things you did, because in actuality, you didn't do nothing. Well, I did something. Yeah, you did. You believed. And that gave him access to go to work. In the old covenant, we work for God. This is going to sound strange. Watch this. But in the new covenant, God's working for us. Yeah. He's working for us. Wow totally contradicting my thinking religiously. I would, I, who, I would, God working for me? I would probably have considered that statement blasphemous. But the Holy Spirit, thank God, He leads us and He guides us. Now, I know some people thinking, I, I don't know how we think sometimes when we hear stuff like this. You're still thinking about what to do without, first of all, cultivating this relationship with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to get yourself in trouble because you're going to get some little weird revelation about what you need to do. I mean, Jesus already said, John chapter 6, the only thing I want you to do is to believe in the one that I sent you, and you're still trying to add more to that. Now, you hear that he does the work, and you're just believing as it looks like you ain't going to be doing nothing. What am I supposed to do, just sit and let him do the work? No, you're supposed to live. You're supposed to live. And as you're living, what did he say? The Spirit of God will guide you. So as you're living, he's going to start telling you what to do in these situations of life. That's what going to, instead of you writing a list of the things you're going to discipline yourself to do, he said, live. And as we encounter these different things, I'm going to be your guide. Glory to God. You know, I, when, I went to, when I went to Italy for the first time, you know, while I was there, I was like, I, I don't know nothing about all this stuff. So I hired a guide, and he, he, boy, he knew everything. In fact, one day, after two days, we met him and said, all right, now listen, we don't want to learn none today. We, we just want to look, okay? <laughs> Because he have you standing there, he give you a whole lesson. Oh, my God, dog, you going to give a test after you give all this? <laughs> but he gave us guidance. So as we encountered certain things, we had somebody to explain it to us, what to do, what not to do, where not to go, why not to do that. Wow. The Holy Spirit said, all right, live in your waking up time, and your going to work time, and your going to bed time, and your relationship time, and I'm going to guide you through it. I'm going to guide you. It's a personal trainer. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to personally, glory to God. How do you do that? A God who will personally take each of us little dust balls. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What is this God? who is so intimately concerned about every last one of us that he says, I will, who, has, who does that? How does he give personal time to everybody? That's why he's a God who's everywhere at the same time. That's, that's what he's going to be doing. He's going to be doing, he's going to be guiding and working through every last one of you. He's, he's, he's doing it. And, and, but you, you, don't, you don't get this little thing about, well, you know, since God doing all the work, then I might as well. See, there you go. You're messing up. Live. Just live. I, yeah, you, you know, most people want to just try to be morally right. I mean, you don't want to do stupid stuff. You don't, you don't want to kill, steal, you know, do something on somebody's property. You want to try to be honorable in, in what you, you're trying to do. I, I guess this is a different kind of generation. They don't even care nothing about that. But, you know, it, it's... But the Holy Spirit says, whatever it is that life brings to you, I'm here. I got you. It's going to put you in a position where now you're going to be uh, depending on him. 
I got to have a relationship with him. I right, God, how do I handle this? This hurts. Okay, God, how do I handle this? They're not listening to me. God, I love my kids, and I'm trying to tell them don't do this and don't do that because, you know, I did it and I knew what happened. He says, all right, I'm going to show you what to do, and they'll start listening to you. Well, but what if they don't? He says, I got it. And you start walking with him? But then there's that ego part, that human part of you that wants to say, I'm not going to take that chance in depending on God to tell me what to do. Because after all, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We get all that carnal uh, stuff that comes through norms and values of society. And what's normal is what was deemed by society. Society, society said it's all right, so it must be all right. Isn't that something? Isn't that something how society took something that we knew wasn't right, and they made it right today? They made it right. Society took it, and it's right because society says it's right. That's a norm and a value based on society. Norms and values are, are, are what society decides. Society determines now what's moral and what's not moral. Society determines that. And then what happens is over time, that moral thing remains, and then it's adopted by a generation, and then the generation says it's okay because one day somebody said it was okay because they don't have a basis for truth, what used to be the word. Every one of us remember our mama and daddy telling us some kind of Bible something, even if it wasn't, but God don't like ugly. <laughs> or what, what goes around comes around. Yeah. Or grandmama sitting in there, you get up early Sunday morning and the gospel airs or, or southern airs were on the radio. Brother Esmond Patterson right here in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Get up and that gospel music playing. Now, what nobody say, but that was just, it was grandma, when she was old enough, she like, I need to get my stuff together, I'm old. But now, there's a whole new level of what is called morally right based on the norms and values of society and what people think. You know, and, and let me know if you remember this, but there was a time in church when it, when it came time to vote, the pastor would say, pray and vote your conscience. Vote for whoever the Lord tell you to vote for. Because whoever wins, Democrat or Republican, they're going to need God. 